Hello, everyone, and welcome to Progressive Equipment's educational webinar on solvent systems. I'm Mark Trigenti, the Director of Design Engineering and Business Development for Burr Process Equipment. I want to, and I want to welcome everyone uh, to this broadcast. Uh, today we're going to be reviewing um, in kind of a short, in a kind of a short presentation here, uh, solvent systems in general, talking about their uses, kind of what a solvent is by definition, some of the different requirements for, for solvent collection systems and transfer systems. Uh, as well as talk about kind of like a bit of a case studies here at the end. I would like to keep things uh, somewhat casual here. So as you can see um, on your uh, go to bar, you do have a questions window. You can feel free to type those type questions in at any point during the broadcast and we'll try to answer them on air. And if and there will also be time for questions at the end. If there are any questions that come up afterwards or that we don't get to during the broadcast, we'll be more than happy. Uh, to respond to uh, individual questions by email after the broadcast. There will be a couple of polls that are optional if people would like to participate as we go along here. So uh, please sit back and I hope you guys enjoy the presentation. So I want to kind of open up with sort of a broad definition of what a solvent, of what a solvent is. And as you can see on your screen, a solvent is a broad chemistry term used to describe a substance that another substance can be dissolved into. Water is the most common solvent, um, but that's not really what we're going to be focusing on so much today. Um, you know, wet chemistry, uh, which is what a lot of the different technologies um, that we process uh, works with a lot of its clients on, you know, deals well with water and pH and the effects, you know, high purity water and talking about water and water as a solvent and that characteristic. But today we're really going to be talking more about organic solvents, um, which are generally volatile hydrocarbons, uh, which are used in a lot of different processes. And when I talk about solvents like this, probably the most common household solvent that people can kind of relate to is paint thinner, which is a form of toluene. Um, and as anybody knows, who's ever worked with paint thinner, or obviously in an industrial setting, you're talking about solvents, you're talking about a much larger scale. Uh, and a lot of different chemicals, for example, that can kind of fall into that general category, you do, you do need to handle that. You do need to handle that uh, properly due to its fumes, due to its nature. You can't obviously flush it or, or send it down the drain. Um, it's not allowed me to be specially collected. So what we're really going to focus on today is those types of solvents in different types of systems and technology that either on an industrial or academic scale um, how those how those types of solvents are collected, you you know, utilized, stored, um, recovered, um, as well as treated. So solvents are used in a wide variety of industries. Semiconductor industry probably one of the big ones. Uh, for those who are familiar with it, processes such as the SOG process, which is referred to as spin on glass, um, is a method. Is, is a fairly large solvent process. Uh, for doing uh, tin plating um, between different um, between different circuit board sheets, um, the general industry also uses it quite a bit. Obviously, the paint industry is a big is a big utilizer. Pharmaceutical things such as H, such as high performance liquid chromatography, um, those actual bead processes that are used there um, are a form of an organic solvent which is utilized um, for the use in the chromatography machine. Cosmetics. Uh, for different cleaning agents and even the food industry um, in, in certain applications that will use different types of solvent based systems. So I mentioned one before, obviously toluene. There's a lot of different solvents out there. And that's one of the things that does kind of come up when you're kind of looking at these different chemicals and kind of thinking about if you're working on a design or if you're using any of these in your facility. Is how you really want to utilize, you know, really how you can how you can safely handle them, as well as how they can be safely disposed of. I mean, some of these are fairly benign, like isopropyl alcohol, for example. But even that, in high concentrations, can't be sent down the drain. Um, things like toluene obviously need to be taken away separately. Um, ethylene glycol, ethyl acetate, just to kind of go through sort of a few different ones. And a lot of times the requirements um, for these need to be reviewed 
uh, from both the safety uh, as well as the permitting process, but also from an insurance requirement. Uh, that a lot of times determines the type of area readings, for example, that can be utilized for these different types of systems, um, whether or not it's going to be a hazardous area or there's not a hazardous area. Some of these do and some of these don't, depending upon classification. Some will be class one bid two, some will be class one bid one, um, depending upon what the application is, as well as what EHS, insurance, things like that are going to want to look at for these systems. So, what is a solvent system? There's a lot of different examples. You can see a couple here. One on the, uh, on the, on the, on the left is more of a solvent collection and transfer. Um, the one on the right is more of a process-based solvent system. So solvent, solvent systems are broken down into four primary categories. You have process solvent feed systems. You have waste solvent transfer systems, solvent collection, and then solvent recovery systems. We're going to kind of look at each one of these um, individually here in a couple of minutes and then kind of delve into um, some of the different nuances that go into these various systems um, that kind of either make them safe or some of the different technologies uh, which make them more practical um, and less expensive to operate. So, as I kind of mentioned briefly a few minutes ago, a lot of solvents um, will require the use of a class one, bid two, or class one, or bid one, or some or some form of a hazardous environment uh, where they where they will be utilized. Um, certainly not all of them do. Um, in the case of something like isopropyl alcohol or ethanol, for example, they kind of do fall under this category, um, and they're commonly used in things like the pharmaceutical industry. But they don't necessarily, obviously, need to be um, hazardous. So this is kind of an example here of a non-hazardous based system. And while a lot of solvents will require the use of metallic or stainless steel storage, um, because most of these heavy organic chains uh, will dissolve thermoplastics, that's certainly not the case um, overall. Um, and so there are a few, such as this one here, which can actually reside in a thermoplastic vessel. And this is the type of system that you would commonly see um, for feeding either, either something like IPA or ethanol um, or some of these different products that are utilized very often in like inhaler-based chemistries uh, for the pharmaceutical industry, um, you know, in more of a pharma plant where you have a USP class six and you have all stainless steel and it operates more of like a pharmaceutical vessel um, as opposed to really operating um, in, in the way you would traditionally think of a solvent system. So sanitary design, um, thermoplastic materials, not hazardous. This is, again, a form of solvent or solvent process transfer um, that doesn't fall into that realm. And you can just see here PNID, how it's set up. You have a drum transfer system here, um, which goes into a storage tank. You can transfer out um, into, you know, easily into your CGMP process area. Um, everything in USP class six. Um, sanitary design as well as thermoplastic storage tank. Probably 80% of solvent based systems are, however, going to end up being some kind of an area rated device, which is going to push you more into the realm of things like stainless steel, which you can see here um, on the right, or into more of a coated stainless steel tank, uh, depending on different. Uh, types of different depending on what your actual process, what your actual chemistry is. And here on the, on, 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 I'm sorry, here on the right, this is the other one on the left. Here on the right, you can see this is a Teflon um, or Halar coated stainless steel uh, tank and piping system. Again, that's very chemical dependent, depending on what you're going to be utilizing in your system. And solvent systems in general. And again, there are obviously some exclusions if you're working on a very large semiconductor fab, for example, um, you know, they can be generating quite a bit, but generally solvents are utilized in fairly small quantities, um, even in industrial applications. Um, a lot of it goes a long way and is usually very specialized processes, which are going to be involved with these types of systems. So most of the time, you know, you're not looking at a lot of generated um, either solvent products or solvent waste. Uh, which needs to be handled. Obviously, some exclusions do, do apply. And if you're working on a, you know, a three or four billion dollar uh, fab, for example, they might put in some very large underground solvent tanks and things like that to catch up uh, from the entire facility. 
they can range in size um, from as big as a, as, as a basic storage chemical cabinet down to things as small as this guy. There's more like a conventional microwave at that point to basically hold 10 or 20 gallons um, of a different solvent type chemistry. So we're talking about hazardous location solvent systems. This is kind of regardless of whether you're talking about a process, a process feed or collection or transfer. Um, very often they're going to be stainless steel, as I mentioned, but they're going to be a coated stainless steel. Um, they generally will be hazardous class one div one or class one div two. And that rating can actually vary depending upon whether or not you're, you know, you're close to the system or your equipment's going to be located a little bit further from the actual system when you're doing the collection. Pneumatics and air operated diaphragm pumps are commonly utilized. Um, it's a lot of times very important to avoid the use of, of 460 volt power in these systems, if at all possible. There may be special venting requirements, which we'll talk about a little later on. Uh, nitrogen blanketing or purging, um, as well as well as fire suppression based systems. Either in the room is it going to be located um, or is actually part of the system itself. So. You can see here's a kind of a basic uh, solvent transfer based system and kind of coming in highlighting here you can see it obviously it's the same picture on the right and the left. Um, you have your waste feed coming in, uh, you have your nitrogen uh, blanketing over here, this is your waste line in, this is um, a flame arrest, this is a conservation vent which we'll talk about in a few minutes, level controls, um, all pneumatic, sorry I lost my pointer here. Um, then coming off here, you can see the different um, air operated diaphragm pumps which are utilized for transfer of the system. This is what you would see as kind of a basic um, hazardous location, whether it's solvent or it's chemical um, based um, transfer system. I mentioned before that pneumatics are, are, are very often utilized in these systems. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, as I mentioned the voltage requirement. Sometimes you do you will require uh, some level of higher flow in these systems. And utilizing a pneumatic based pump, such as like an aero um, air operated diaphragm pump, for example, allows you to only place either 120 volt or a lot of people's preference is just low voltage solenoids in the actual hazardous area. Um, and then you, you know, just for the air control to the pump, you avoid having to put explosion proof motors in. Um, and then running a lot of high voltage into these different types of applications. It also gives you the benefit of having a self priming and the ability to run dry or really drain down your system so you're not storing uh, any excess solvent in whatever your transfer system is. You can basically totally pump the system out. In addition, obviously, to the pumps and the valves as well. Um, you know, you, you know, air, air, you, you often use you air to spring based valves, but you do have safety in the case of a power failure, they just simply spring close, which avoids the need for things like costly battery backups in your system, uh, as well as different NEMA 7 enclosures. They're also a lot faster to operate for the most part on pneumatically actuated valves. So it does sort of increase the overall efficiency and then in safety uh, of the system. Again, due to the chemical compatibility, some solvents will generally dissolve most non-fluorinated plastics, you know, Teflon being a bit of an exception, in some cases, Halar and some other ones as well. Um, stainless steel is generally utilized for these types of systems. Um, and it can be different things. You know, um, a lot of times the actual tank itself or the cabinet is located in a cabinet-based system will also be stainless steel. And there are some different standards that can be applied, particularly that is going to be more of a pressure vessel, which isn't 100% common with these types of systems, but certainly can be ASME type and ASME 9, ASME boiler code pressure, um, and different welding specifications that are oftentimes utilized in the construction of these systems. And if it is a cabinet based system, then you will want to use FM or, um, or, or NFPA. Um, hazardous chemical cabinets as well. Here's a few different examples here, some different stainless steel tank uh, configurations and pipings which are utilized in, in these different systems. I mentioned earlier that nitrogen 
uh, very often comes into play uh, with these systems. And nitrogen really serves a lot of different purposes. Um, very often when you're dealing uh, with solids that can have a fair amount of vapor pressure, which means that they can evaporate into the atmosphere, either above the tank, uh, inside the tank, or in the actual enclosure where, where they're located. So nitrogen tank blanketing is an effective means, essentially, of preventing that off-gassing uh, by forming a layer of nitrogen over the surface. This can be really helpful for fire suppression because you don't have um, this potentially flammable gas located above the actual liquid. And this is only typically injected during a vacuum cycle if you actually have a pump down. So when you're actually drawing, obviously, down the tank, you want to be drawing the atmosphere in, which can then mix with the volatile um, solvent organic located above the actual solvent tank. Sometimes for filling applications, if you have like a drum collection, they'll do what's called a nitrogen purge. And that's a little bit different in where they'll actually fill the drum with nitrogen and then they'll actually allow it to be filled. So basically what happens is the solvent then offsets the nitrogen, which is just one of the means of maintaining the nitrogen blanket, but also causes it but also prevents the actual solvent entering the tank from mixing with any with any actual atmosphere located within the drum. Um, within the drum or vessel itself, because the vessel is going to be filled with, basically filled with nitrogen. It was just a standalone tank. Uh, without any kind of pumping, you don't need a lot of nitrogen, but if you do have, if you, if you have a pump, which will be drawing off of your tank, then it is important to properly size your nitrogen feed for the tank. And that's typically done as a nitrogen feed. Um, the nitrogen flow um, in CFH is equal to the basically the pump flow rate times eight. And the actual amount of nitrogen, which is going to be utilized in the system, the actual pressure you need is really very low. Um, generally one and a half to two inches of water column required for nitrogen. And again, the use of nitrogen is highly advised when you do have a flammable solvent, um, but it's not necessarily required for all of them. In addition to being utilized uh, for the actual tank itself, nitrogen is also commonly utilized in the control panels for these types of systems. And this is because a lot of times you will try to use what's referred to as a purge panel. And a purge panel is essentially very similar to kind of purging a process vessel. You'll have a control panel which has a purge kit on it, and I think it should, which is this guy right here. And what this is doing, this is basically holding a certain amount of pressure in the electronics of the panel itself, which, which will prevent any kind of solid-based vapors in the area from getting into the panel. And this would generally is utilized predominantly in class one div two applications. It can be used in some class one div one applications as well, um, but it's not common. And the amount of nitrogen that you're actually utilizing um, in your purge can actually can kind of tell you how big of a panel box you can actually utilize uh, within a purge system. So as an example, if you have 15 SCFH, you'd be able to make a 10 cubic foot box, class one div two, but for a class one div one, you would basically need two cubic feet. And depending on which classification in class one div one, our purge is not allowed in general. That being said, even if you have a purge-based panel, it is often sometimes required to put in what's referred to it as an intrinsic barrier. Intrinsic barrier is, is a device located in the panel, which is either going to be tied to a discrete or analog device, which is coming off of your uh, tank or solvent-based system. And generally, you have one barrier per input coming into the system. And that just basically is a means to prevent anything from coming through the actual line um, into the actual control panel. Purge panels are, are very often a preference over, there's the arrow there, more of a true NEMA 7 um, explosion proof panel. And the reason I say that is, you know, this is your kind of classic hazardous class 1 did one panel. You have the heavy aluminum doors which are bolted on with, you know, with the, with the you know, class 1 div 1 operators. The, and you see a lot in the oil and gas industry where the whole area is class one, div one, and even even in some even in some solvent applications, 
the downside of boxes like this is if you're looking at going into more of a PLC based system, you have to load the PLC or the HMI heat machine interface is not going to be rated to be put on the out, be put on the face of these panels. So if you actually need to access the PLC or the HMI, you would actually have to go inside of the class one div one box, one of these to then make any system adjustments. Which is why we generally you generally try to steer away from utilizing these if you have to go into more sophisticated controls for these types of systems. Um, you know, in a, in a purge-based system, a lot of HMIs, you know, a lot of the major brand Rockwell, Siemens, or the HMIs are actually designed uh, class one div two uh, purge rated. So it is very often preferable to do that. It's also not uncommon and can be somewhat economical if the actual controls themselves can be located outside of the hazardous area. Um, you would still need to either add ex you know, explosion proof conduit and pore fittings to connect it to the system, but then it allows you the freedom to basically build a control panel um, as you would want to without having to go down the road, especially UL listings are using, you're, you're utilizing some of these different technologies such as purge kits or these larger NEMA 7, on, NEMA 7 boxes. In addition to the nitrogen, um, a lot of solid systems have what's referred to as a as a conservation vent. And a conservation vent is designed to basically divert the basically designed to divert the hazardous um, atmosphere above the solvent liquid you're collecting uh, from mixing. Um, and basically, pump basically pipes it away uh, whenever you're in a vacuum or you're in a pressure relief application. So it's basically a means of diverting that away from the actual environment that you're actually working in. And this can actually be very helpful um, as to nitrogen blanketing and lowering down the, the hazardous area rating um, around your system. So if you do have a lift station, you do have a solid collection system, this is a very good means to help you move you away from a class one div one and possibly down to a class one div two. It can be used in conjunction with nitrogen as well, but doesn't necessarily need to be. In addition to a conservation vent, flame arresters are often installed in these systems. And what a flame arrester is designed to do, and the flame arrester doesn't have to be on the actual process itself or the actual tank or vessel that you're utilizing in the solvent because that's you're locating the vent line, it essentially stops the propagation of a fire from entering into your tank. So if you do end up with a fire in the atmosphere or in the vent line above, um, above your process vessel, this will prevent that fire from getting into the tank or into the actual hazardous solution for which you are storing. So it basically operates as a good means of fire protection in your system. Because of the volatile nature of a lot of the different chemicals that are being utilized in solvent systems, and I kind of mentioned this a few times as we've gone along here, it's not uncommon for these systems to be built into cabinet-based designs. Again, you're not generally talking about a lot of different solution um, for these systems. So if you do have a transfer or collection or transfer system, putting it inside an actual cabinet does offer a lot of benefits. Um, it has integral spill protection. Um, it, can have, it, can have, it can have its own fire suppression system separate from the actual um, building, except from the actual building that's going to be located in. It does allow for fume control. You can have conservation of flame rushers located on the cabinet as opposed, to, as opposed to on the tank. And then also due to the pneumatics which are being utilized in the system, you, you can have a lot of sound dampening as well. Obviously not all of these can be done that way. And moving them outside of the cabinet obviously allows for a lot bigger systems. Generally, a cabinet-based system is kind of capped at around 350 to 500 gallon totes if you're going to be utilizing them for collection, um, or it can be done quite a, or you know, or tanks. Whereas if you have a loose-based system, uh, such as the one here, you can kind of make it as obviously as big as you want. Um, the disadvantage is that, it, it, is that you lose some of the safety features associated with putting it into more of its own enclosure at that point.
if you are talking, you know, very often, as I mentioned, you're kind of breaking down the four different systems. You have solvent transfer, you know, for process. You have solvent waste transfer, solvent collection, and you have solvent treatment. Um, it's very common to tie a waste solvent collection to a waste um, solvent transfer system. And very often, these are, you, you, know, you have a waste collection, you have a waste transfer system located in your process, which then transfers it either to a bulk storage collection system or into more of a cabinet or drum based storage collection system. And very often just due to the nature of these systems, you know, they will they they could be located in a cabinet themselves. They can also be located in a pit. Um, and they generally air tight. You can see here you have um, the conservation vents, you can have the flame arresters um, as well when you're talking about a solvent transfer system in addition to a solvent collection system. So. Some of the advantages, advantages of talking about solvent collection systems in general, particularly cabinet-based ones, is obviously, as I mentioned before, you have the double containment. If you have a drum-based system, you have different proximity alarms to make sure the drum is staying in the right place. The system is also going to be grounded. Integral fire, integral fire suppression systems, you can have automatic self-closing, not sparking doors. Um, should a fire break out in the area? Um, and if you are or, or utilizing drums, for example, for hall law, which we're going to talk about how you treat solvent here in a second, um, this also gives you a good ability to kind of just have a drum with and sort of pull them out here. This example uh, here on the right, there's actually load cells for measuring. This is your double containment down here, your self closing doors. There's a fire suppression system up here. And this can also, and this would also have the integral transfer as well, should you want to pump down the drum uh, to more of an offsite collection system. So, so, while people do make solvent recovery systems, most people don't do um, solvent recovery on site. As I mentioned before, you can't actually put solvent down the drain um, or treat it for discharge into any kind of municipal uh, treatment facility. Because of the low volume, generally, generally um, amassed in a facility uh, for the use of solvent, solvents are typically taken off site um, for treatment, whether that be um, treatment or that be separation. There generally are large solvent companies that take these, they basically take these spent drums and then they'll actually use a vaporization process to then reseparate out the different chemicals, you basically separate the solvents out as a form of solvent recovery, and then they basically sell them back to the clients. That's the most common form. Um, small scale solvent systems can be done, um, but due to the energy cost and, and infrastructure required, unless you're, unless you're a large solvent producer, um, there's not a lot of economics to really pursuing that avenue. Solvents are generally treated when they're not recovered in really two, in really just two ways. Um, most of them are burned uh, or combusted, and then those, then those gases are basically purged essentially. That's the most efficient way of destroying different solvents. The other means was referred to as an advanced oxidation process. In, in advanced oxidation, the solvent is taken and is exposed to high levels of radiation by UV light, as well as things like ozone. And that can actually break down the carbon structure of the unit uh, of the solvent itself, which then passes it into a more benign realm of things like nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water. Um, the combustion process is by far and away the more common, particularly for large degrees of solvent. So, just kind of looking at one uh, really quick example here. Um, Kind of how the systems sort of go together. Um, this, is, this is just an example here of, of a solvent collection stations, um, which are designed to transfer the high performance liquid chromatography waste solvent. Um, then, just um, so you have here, you, have, you basically have a solvent collection pit. Um, you have a set of solvent collection transfer, which are located adjacent to the pit in this case, where you can see the stainless steel, um, the different air valve fittings, as well as pulsation dampers, which are utilized in these systems. Off of a level control, these are then transferred into more of a drum based collection system. 
Um, you have the different feeds here, shut off valves to so basically fill one drum and then the other. These are your conservation vents, which are located here. You have level instrumentation. Um, that's your fire suppression system located up here as, as an example. And once these drums are basically, you basically you have one major, you have one control system tying these two systems together. Um, whereby once once one drum is full, switches to the second drum. And tells, and then once that's full, then the signal can basically deactivate your waste transfer, your waste transfer solvent system. Um, this is just another example. Here, you, here you have more of a cabinet-based waste transfer system. And you know, as I mentioned before, if you do have a high level in both of your drums, that would go back then to the actual lift station in that case. Um, then it could either cascade or could be transferred to another lift station here on site um, for that offsite collection. Um, this is just an example of a lift station built into a cabinet. You can see here, um, these are actually a little um, shell where the drums can actually pull out. You have the self-closing doors, conservation vent, uh, leak sensors here as well. And this is just some of the features here that go into some of these different systems. Um, well, it's not common. A lot of times you will actually have a control panel or a line panel located on top of these systems as well. Just want to make some announcements here. Uh, we will have another webinar coming up on September 23rd um, after kind of give people a break uh, for the summer. And then we'll have another webinar um, special uh, on a focus on the pharmaceutical industry coming up on November 18th. Uh, I do hope everybody enjoyed this webinar. We do have a few questions here to go through, but if anybody has any further questions, certainly feel free to type them into the, into the questions window at this time. So our first question, could I elaborate more on control on PLC integration with purge cabinets? So a lot of different PLC manufacturers will actually make special um, HMIs. In some cases, it's just general HMIs, um, which, which, which they themselves um, are rated for installation on a class one div two panel. Um, so you would basically, a lot of times what you'll have is you'll have a standard room of 4X panel um, that is then converted with a purge kit. And that's how you really formulate an actual purge panel um, and the HMI is rated for use in a class one div two. Um, there's different group rings, A, B, C, and D. I didn't really quite go into that um, in depthly. Um, that's kind of its own separate conversation. And that's kind of, that's really how you rate them. So first thing on itself doesn't necessarily change the NEMA rating. Um, it's generally either NEMA 4 NEMA 4X enclosure that then is retrofitted with an actual purge kit. So generally the HMI or the PLC electronics will say that they are rated for a purge located on either NEMA 4X or NEMA 4 control panel. They don't really make HMIs that are rated for like NEMA 7 enclosures. Um, that just has to do with how a NEMA 7 enclosure is built. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, if you have the, um, if you have those heavy aluminum doors, those doors are generally about two inches thick. If the idea that there is an explosion inside of that inside of that enclosure, um, it won't actually rupture the panel. And HMI cannot be retrofitted to that to that because they're simply just not built for it, and they would not allow for that level of sealing required for installation in your NEMA seven enclosure. Another question here. If you have a hazardous location process-based feed system similar to the pharmaceutical one earlier, um, what changes would be made to that type of a system? Um, not really all that much, to be honest. If you have, obviously in that case, they're using a chemical which was benign enough, in, the case, in that case, ethanol for use of a thermoplastic. I'm assuming if you did have to use something that was gonna be a hazardous location, it would more than likely have an impact on the thermoplastic material being utilized, so you probably have to convert that tank into more of a electro-polished sort of um, uh, um, sanitary design. 
Um, but really from there, the balance of the system would remain fairly unchanged. Um, you still have your polished stainless steel uh, piping. You still have the same pneumatics that would be utilized within the system. It would be just more of a function of how the tank itself would change um, if you're doing more of like a pharmaceutical process solvent transfer. Um, in semiconductors, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll literally transfer them either out of just bulk stainless steel tanks, um, which are in sort of a non-polished conformity, because uh, again, the bacteria then at that point or something like that isn't really as much of a concern. Um, and you know, or or simply out of drums, and then those will, and then those will simply be transferred down into your solvent transfer, or solvent collection based system at that point. So we have one more question here. Can I talk a little bit more about non cabinet non cabinet based solvent uh, waste collection? Sure. So so. A lot of times we use the term cabinet, and obviously for anybody here who's familiar um, with some of the different people out there like ourselves who make these systems, it's because of the volumes that are utilized, um, the kind of ease of transfer, people very often talk about um, utilizing um, like 55 gallon drums or 200 gallon coats. Um, and then kind of with it really because that collection process can take a fair amount of time, a couple of weeks or even a month. For there to be sufficient solvent volume, it's very often kind of a safety thing. You put them in a you have a cabinet, um, you, you store your toe, you store, you store your drum in there, and then you collect it. Um, but on the flip side of that, if, if obviously if it's a much higher solvent collection system, this can be scaled up. And you know, we I just did a project not that long ago um, for a client um that was a large uh was a large blood testing company and what they were doing there they were generating a lot of different um solvent based chemicals so they had um six thousand gallon stainless steel tanks in a vault so similar concept everything kind of just scales up and becomes loose at that point so we have six thousand gallon tanks and you have six inch you know conservation vents and your fill rate at eight inch line um, and that's also what you would see very often on more of like a fab based system as well. If they're going to be generating thousands of gallons of this type of solvent chemistry waste um, over the course of, you know, a matter of a week or so, you're obviously not going to go with that where you go to more of a loose or multi drum configuration in a lot of those cases. Probably the last one here. Um, are most of the solvent transfer systems duplexed? I'd say a lot of them are. You know, a lot of that has to do with just the redundancy and the nature of what you're dealing with. Obviously, you don't want to be spilling some of these chemistries on the floor if you do have a pump failure. That being said, um, it's not uncommon, to, especially in very small systems, uh, to simply have a simplex configuration in that case as well. All right, everyone, I want to thank you again. If there's any more questions, certainly feel free to send them over. And uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And if I don't talk to you guys, have a great summer. Thank you.